Welcome. I'm Nikki Young, Program Manager with the Child Neurology Foundation. Today's talk is part of our ongoing series on epilepsy management. Today, we are discussing sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, or SUDA. We heard from our partners and our families that this was a top priority. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jeff Buckhalter. Welcome, and thank you for joining me today. Would you mind to just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Well, thank you. Thank you, Nikki, and, and thanks to the Child Neurology Foundation for involving me in this, uh, in this video series. Uh, I've been a pediatric neurologist for about 35 years, and the majority of that time as a pediatric epilepsy specialist. Um, uh, over a decade ago, I was brought into the um, sudden unexpected death community by a parent whose son died at the age of 21 years of age. And she really has been a strong voice for the community doing better. So based on Gene Donaldy's uh, motivation, uh, we started the first Partners Against Mortality and Epilepsy meeting, which occurs every year, every other year. And we also generated the American Academy of Neurology SUDEP guidelines. So this is a topic that is unfortunately uh, very familiar to me. Well, we appreciate having you here for your expertise. Um, so during this video, we're gonna cover some of kind of the frequently asked questions regarding SUDEP. Um, but also before this recording, we reached out to our audience to see what questions they may have. So I have some of those as well um, from parents. So just to get us started, what is SUDEP and how often does it happen? So SUDEP stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. And, and based upon writings about epilepsy, we know that people started describing what we now know as SUDEP in the 17th and 18th centuries. So nothing new. Uh, it, it's only been in the last two decades that due to the work, uh, the research work of epidemiologists, that, that SUDEP has really come to public attention. And, and just for the audience, um, um, epidemiology is that area of science that's concerned with how often a particular disorder happens, what are the risk factors, and what ages in the population does it occur. So our current understanding of SUDEP is that it occurs in one in 1,000 patient years. And what that means is that if you followed a thousand people with epilepsy for one year, one person would die of SUDEP. However, based on certain risk factors that we're going to talk about, there is a risk of one in 100, 10 times greater in some populations, depending upon the severity of, of the seizures. And it's proven, it's not proven, but it's certainly possible that individuals in the pediatric population with the developmental epileptic encephalopathies, such as the Lennox-Castot syndrome, could have even a greater risk. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the biggest challenges and changes in our thinking about the role of age in SUDEP has only occurred in the last two or three years. When we wrote the AAN SUDEP guideline in 2017, we believed that SUDEP occurred three to four times more commonly in adults than children. However, recent work from multiple countries has demonstrated that the incidence of SUDEP is the same in children and adults across the age spectrum. Well, and I heard you mention a few but are there, are there some specific risk factors that parents should be aware of um, if, if their child may get risk for SUDEP? Absolutely. The most powerful risk factor for SUDEP is the type and frequency of seizures. The literature is very clear uh, that generalized tonic-clonic seizures are the seizure type most associated uh, with SUDEP. And then we get to the issue of frequency. It's also been demonstrated that having as many as 
three per year can increase your risk eight to 10 times or more. So our goal is always seizure freedom. Now, one of the problems with identifying generalized tonic-clonic seizures is that frequently in children, there are different seizure types. Tonic seizures, which characterize a number of the childhood epilepsies, such as non syndrome, syndrome, do, do not have that clonic component. But it's our suspicion, our strong suspicion, that these can be just as fatal. Um, there's also the reality that the majority of SUDEPs occur during sleep. And so the big red flags for families uh, and patients is that when generalized tonic-clonic seizures or tonic seizures occur during sleep, that should set off all of the alarms, which indicate that something should be done very, very quickly to improve uh, the frequency of these big seizures. Unfortunately, in the last few years, we've also come to learn that SUDEP can occur without generalized tonic-clonic seizures or even having very few seizures. So no one is really safe. Is there anything that a parent or caregiver can do to reduce their risk or prevent SUDEP in any way? A absolutely. And, and um, what we're really focused on in all branches of science is understanding and prevention of SUDEP. Uh, it all begins with a frank discussion between the patient or their care providers and the neurologist who's caring for them. It has to start with the conversation, which is very uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, and it is uh, frightening. As, as the one who's on uh, one side of it, I, I, I know that very well. However, the literature has demonstrated that this is a conversation that parents expect to have, just as you would expect to have a conversation about the most serious complication of any disorder that you or your child was diagnosed with. So it's becoming standard of practice that the conversation uh, has to occur. Uh, and then you move on to what can you do about it? And based on what we've already said, your goal is having zero seizures, if possible, with the knowledge that for many of the childhood epilepsies, that's not going to be realistic. Mm -hmm. However, the strategy for prevention needs to be individualized according to a patient's seizure type, syndrome, um, uh, and importantly, and not always discussed, social determinants of health. And by that, I mean, if a child is not getting a medication because it's too expensive, then there needs to be one of two interventions. Either means need to be found to supply that medication to the family, or it needs to be changed to a medication that the family can afford. Another type of uh, uh, intervention is lifestyle. Uh, getting a good night's sleep uh, is a very, very important thing to do for children and adults. And so there are those lifestyle things. And then we get to what most people think of first uh, is medication, anti-seizure medication. The question is, is the right medication being used at the appropriate doses? Because if those things aren't true, then that needs to happen. If the answer is yes, it's time to consider another medication as that child by definition has intractable epilepsy. If a child or an adult fails to appropriate medication, the next question should be, is epilepsy surgery a possibility? Regrettably, this is often thought of as a last ditch effort but it really shouldn't be because in the right population of children and adults, epilepsy surgery can be 
curative. And, and remember, we're just asking the question to the neurologist. No one is doing um, any kind of surgery. It's just, is someone a candidate? If surgery isn't feasible, what else is available? Well, we have the vagus nerve stimulator. And that's something that's been used in children for over a decade. And there's some evidence that it actually decreases the rate of SUDEP. And, and I'm sorry that I didn't say this just a, just a sentence or two ago, but it's been demonstrated by research that epilepsy surgery, when successful, significantly decreases the rate of SUDEP. Mm -hmm. And then we also have dietary therapies, such as the ketogenic diet, or the modified Atkins diet, or the low glycemic index therapy. These should be considered sooner rather than later in kids whose medications aren't controlled by medication, the first few, and are not candidates for surgery. So in summary, there's a variety of options available to prevent SUDEP that start with an open discussion and then a very aggressive approach to management. Thank you for mentioning so many actionable items. I know um, you mentioned a little bit about diet and we're going to cover that in another video. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for to touch on that as well. So if, if you're interested more about diets, we're going to cover that shortly. Right. Um, Dr. Buckleser, you mentioned a lot of good actionable steps and things that parents should consider when talking to their doctor about how to prevent SUDEP. Um, I just want to reiterate some of those if that's okay. So just an ind individualized plan based on their seizure type and what syndrome they have. And then you also included some great, um, great tips for them, including getting a good night's sleep, making sure that they're take, they're on the right medication, the right dose, um, and then those other considerations as well, like um, like diet that we talked about as well. Um, so one one parent actually asked. Um, we're talking a little bit about sleep. They were curious to know about nighttime seizure devices. Um, what would be your advice to make sure that their child has independence and that the parent has peace of mind when it comes to sleep? Uh, that is a very, very good and difficult question. So that parent is, uh, is, is right on. Um, and, and like all good questions, the answer is it depends. Um, obviously it depends if the child is three years old versus they're 16 years old, a young adult. And so the issue of independence, you know, depends on, on where they are in their journey, in their age. Um, peace of mind is extremely difficult. And, you know, and as, as a parent and one who's thought about this for a long time, I'm not sure you, you ever really get complete peace of mind um, but you do the best you can and the most you can. And so, you know, that, that leads to the issue of monitoring devices during sleep. Uh, there's a bunch out there. Some of them are FDA approved. Some of them are not FDA approved. What device is most appropriate for a given person depends on their seizure type. For example, most seizure detectors, warning devices, none of which have been proven to prevent SUDEP, just gotta say that. Um, if, if the seizure type is one of shaking, body shaking, then their devices are very good for picking that up. So one could have a fairly, you know, fairly good peace of mind that if a seizure occurs, you'll know about it. However, if the seizure type involves just staring into space or not being responsive uh, or has very little movement, then the devices aren't nearly as good. And, and so, so my, my counsel would, would be, uh, number one, discuss the option of seizure uh, alerting devices with their care provider. And, and the other is to check out the Dandy Did Foundation, 
um, that has put in a lot of time and effort in helping uh, families understand seizure monitoring devices. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Buckler, for your time. We appreciate you joining us today and sharing your expertise with the child neurology community. Um, for more resources, we're going to put um, some of the resources that Dr. Buckler mentioned, as well as many others on our website at childneurologyfoundation.org. Uh, together, we are all child neurology.